Today we've got a great story of revenge, humiliating somebody on live TV. We'll get to that in a bit, but first, I promote my ex-friend's TikTok posts so she keeps posting for my own entertainment. Hi, I just decided I'd share, but I don't care if it's deemed right or wrong. I genuinely don't care. Don't give me advice, please. In high school, I was considered unattractive and was also a late bloomer. I tried everything under the sun to be attractive and look grown like them, but I failed. This one friend was the prettiest of them all. She was extremely popular and was so perfect. All the boys fell for her and they followed her around. She was everything I couldn't be, but I didn't hate her for it. She was relatively nice to me. Till my last year, we were all together talking and she asks me who I liked in our school. I tell her I liked Josh for a year now and I wasn't pretty enough for him to even notice me. She sounded so nice and reassured me. She's close with Josh and will talk me up to him. I started being a bit close with her. Over past weeks, she'll come back and tell me Josh said this and Josh said that about me and he thinks I'm pretty and he liked me. Her talk up was working. I'd send messages through her to him for weeks, but when I'd run into him, it was like we were strangers. We were talking for weeks, but he acted like he didn't know we've been talking for weeks. And when I tell her, she says, he's just shy, and I'd believe her, and this went on for more weeks, till one of my friends told me it wasn't true. She was doing it as a joke, and that they're dating. They've been dating for months. Everyone knew, and they kept it an inside joke. I was hurt and sad and miserable. She played it off, obviously. Time down, she'd use that to taunt me and laugh at me with everyone, that I wanted her boyfriend. That's only one of the things she did to me. She created heck for me, I was miserable. Now I'm in my last year of college, and I eventually bloomed and I'm doing better than everyone who saw me as a joke. They're still stuck in the same place, making TikToks and they're all the same. They constantly message me, but I'm so far beyond that. I look like a completely different person, and that girl stayed the same. She makes TikToks and I watch them and laugh at how she's the same and still doing the same thing and trends high schoolers are doing. She didn't bloom after her high school bloom. It felt good. I might sound terrible, but it felt so good. I pay for TikTok views and promotion on her posts. Fake, obviously. Just to get her excited so she'd post more and think people are actually watching. The more I promote, the more she posts like six times a day, and each post is cringier and funnier. She does more trends and it looks worse each day, and it entertains me. Definitely not advice, but I feel like it would have to get old at some point. Like, at what point do you have enough fun with leading this person on thinking, oh, they're so popular and famous? I feel like at some point it very quickly goes from maybe funny to you to maybe you should just be kind of sad. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you enjoy crazy stories of revenge, why not hit those like and subscribe buttons down below. That said, our next story is a small but petty revenge. This is from years ago, but I ran into it and thought the pettiness would fit right in. I, female, was very insecure growing up. I had a small group of friends all the way through high school, especially my bestie Liza. She was very beautiful and all the guys liked her. I, on the other hand, was too tall, too skinny, shy, and very insecure. She always dated the guys that I could only dream of dating. One day, a mutual friend told me that when Liza knew that I was interested in a guy, she would go all out to get him interested in her. I didn't believe the mutual friend. Liza was my bestie. She wouldn't do that to me. It had to be a coincidence, but I was talked into testing it out. I thought there was no harm because I had faith in her. The next night, I told her that I had a crush on Brad. He was the soccer star at our school and had a reputation as a love him and leave him guy that I most definitely didn't have a crush on. Sure enough, the next week, Liza and Brad were a couple. I thought back and realized that our mutual friend was right. And every time I told her that I liked someone, she ended up with him. It pissed me off, but I decided to get some revenge before I cut the friendship off completely. I started liking bad boys. You know, the guys that smoked and did drugs and barely got by in school. Sure enough, she started hanging out with the bad boys, drinking and smoking and skipping school. She ended up pregnant and quitting school and honestly I felt bad about that, but she made her own choice to be a skanky friend. I ran into her last week while I was home visiting my parents. She never left the small town we lived in, had been divorced three times. 
I told her that I'd always had a crush on her brother. I wonder what she's going to do with that. In a way, I could understand why you would feel bad for what happened here, but it very much was her own choices that she was making all along the way. It sucks to see anybody go down that road and basically ruin their own lives, but just because you said you liked somebody doesn't mean that you're responsible for any of the decisions beyond that point. Our next story is, you want to be a narcissist? Have fun with that. I had a friend, let's call her A. She was very manipulative and emotionally abusive. She'd threatened to humiliate me with things I'd trusted her with if I didn't help her work. Well, when I left that friendship, I still had her phone number in her emails. So of course, any signups I signed her up for. I put her number and address in for those, if you have religious questions. I know it's not big considering everything she did to me, but it makes me happy knowing at least once a day she has to deal with something mildly crappy. Yeah, if you want to get back at somebody in some small way that hopefully makes you feel at least a little bit satisfied, take their information and sign up for Scientology stuff. Apparently, I've heard they don't quit. Apparently, they are relentless. This next story is, let's see if you like a taste of your own medicine. I'm still getting a lot of heat for this, but only because of the escalation that occurred today. See, there's a faculty member, let's call her Lola, who is beyond annoying. What makes her so annoying? Well, she tended to make everybody wait for her. It didn't help that she was the one responsible for supplying us with what we need for our classroom. For example, when you try to get her to do anything or answer a question, she would always say, oh, give me a moment, I'm so busy, and never gets back to us. Sounds like nothing, right? Well, when you approach her again, Lola responded with the same response. Eventually, you would get so fed up of waiting for her that you would just figure out the solution on your own, only for her to complain that you should have waited for her. And when you tell her that we got tired of chasing her, Lola would always counter with, I'm just so busy, you must be patient with me. This had been going on for about a few weeks now, but I mostly ignored her. I'm self-efficient and I usually buy my own things. That was until she got involved in our Starbucks run. Every time we planned a Starbucks run, the process was always the same. We posted in the group, everybody put down their order, and our boss collects and pays. But every time Lola would say, wait I'm so busy, only not to order anything an hour later. She did this a few more times until they announced that I had enough. My colleagues wanted to know what I was going to do, and I told them that I got an idea. So on Monday, I started taking orders. She did her usual antics and I told her that she got 10 minutes. She tried to object saying that she was so busy but I stood my ground. 10 minutes later, I ordered. 30 minutes later, we got our order and she was fuming. She tried to protest but I told her that I meant what I said. Then she said that I should have waited for her. I just tilted my head and said, hmm, African Americans will understand that gesture. For the whole week, every time she tried to talk to me, I would just give her usual response. I'm busy, oh give me a moment, and things like that, and I do mean every time. Soon it got to the point where she refused to talk to me, which was fine because again, I'm self-reliant. Now here's where the real fun begins. My colleagues on both sides, foreigners and Chinese, started to join in on it, which started to piss her off even more. Nobody wanted to let up, even after being spoken to about it. We all just informed him that we're just doing what she's done to us. Then today, the students, mostly high school students, got involved. I don't know if they saw what we did or heard about it. All I know is that they started to do it too, and being teenagers, they were relentless. Even when she said hi to them, they gave Lola her usual responses. After dealing with this for a week, she finally broke down and cried. I got called into a meeting with my boss after Lola singled me out. He told me that what I did was on the side of cruel and requested that I try to make amends with her. I refused and countered that she needs to grow up and stop acting like she was more important than she actually is. Right now we're at an impasse, but I have this feeling that I got my point across to Lola. I mean, with all this time that she's so busy, does she actually get anything done? If the boss is going to be upset with anybody, maybe they should be upset with Lola who seems to be leaving everybody else hung out to dry. Our next story is, my employer tried to steal $38 from me, so I made them pay $5,000. Back in 1998, I moved from Michigan to Virginia and took a job as an irrigation tech for a large regional landscape company. 
Within six months, I learned my mistake as working as an irrigation tech for landscapers suck. You're treated as a necessary evil and always get the crappy end of the stick. I'd heard through the grapevine that some area managers had screwed up a couple big maintenance contracts and that somehow they were going to try and make me the scapegoat. So I promptly went to the second contractor I'd interviewed for originally and got a job there and put in a one week notice. My manager was really pressuring me to give them more notice until I told him that if he asked me one more time for more notice, that he would notice the following morning that I didn't work there anymore. So at the end of the week, I turned in my uniforms plus my reimbursement slip for $38 petty cash. I was told that I was getting nothing back on my uniforms and that they weren't going to pay my $38. I was pissed but just moved on. The following week, I contacted my local labor board and filed a complaint saying that the entire time I'd worked for them, I was being paid salary while I was a non-exempt employee. I asked to be paid all of my overtime. A few weeks go by and it works its way through the system and I get a call from the corporation's controller. We have a meeting and go over everything with a bunch of back and forth and he was trying to justify that I really was exempt and they didn't owe me anything until I really had enough of this crap. I told them straight up that we might disagree on how much they owe me, but I'll guarantee they owe me something. On top of that, I would make a point on every payday going from branch to branch of the company with a sign standing outside the gate telling every single non-exempt employee that they were screwing out of overtime how they could sue the company. I ended up signing an NDA and got a check for $5,000 the following day. Within two months, that company and several others in the area began paying what they call Chinese overtime. They take your weekly salary and divide it by 40 for an hourly rate, and for every hour of overtime you work, you got half your rate. If you work your way through the math and whatnot and how the labor board determines your overtime in this case, it pretty much worked out correctly. So, in summary, my employer tried to screw me out of $38, and I made them pay me $5,000. I just love the phrase OP said, if he asked me one more time for more notice, he would notice the following morning that I didn't work there anymore. Overall, this just sounded like a terrible place to work in general, definitely putting profits over the people. Our next story is Bluetooth Speaker Revenge. One of my neighbors loves to blast loud music and watch soccer every darn night with his friends. I've had enough and wanted to do something original just to annoy him and give him a good scare. While I was on my phone, I noticed a bunch of devices in the Bluetooth settings. I saw an unsecured Bluetooth speaker, so naturally I waited until they were all asleep, and then I paired my phone with it. I then played a super loud window breaking sound effect. And since there's absolutely no soundproofing here, I could hear it through the wall along with their screams. I had to laugh in a pillow not to get caught. I hope that I'll be able to sleep because I can't stop thinking about it. It was really entertaining. I'll tell you what, this would certainly scare me. I don't think there would be anything more terrifying than laying in bed and all of a sudden hearing what sounds to be a glass window breaking. This next story is, Jerk in Biz Class Treats Me Like Dirt. I work for his competitor and photograph his sales prezzo. I used to be a trade show director in the high tech field and often when problems arose, things ran late and I boarded flights wearing my show floor clothes, jeans and a t-shirt. Such was the case from DC to San Francisco and I took my seat in business class. You rack up multi travel points when you do shows. Seated in the middle was this towering Armani pustule. All ostentatious gold jewelry, obligatory Rolex, Mont Blanc pen with his name on it, monogrammed cuffs in case he actually forgot who he was. He took one look at me as he would a dog turd on his shoe and made a visible play of moving away from his middle seat to the window, ignoring my cheerful, hello, no problem, I don't like conversing with fellow passengers. It always gets awkward knowing when to go back to your book. All went fine until I suddenly heard, you, move. Postule wanted to pee. No excuse me, just move. I went full sycophant parody mode immediately. Yes, sir, Mr. Big Shot with a ridiculous tie. Right away, sir. A couple of people who heard his demands caught on and started grinning, and off he went to the crapper. 
I sat down and glanced over to his table, and there was a binder with a presentation in it with vinyl covers. Hmm. Took a closer look, and it was the annual sales forecast and plan for my company's biggest competitor. Did I mention, dear reader, that I was an avid 35mm photographer back in those pre-digital days? I blew two rolls of film while he was taking a poo. The best part, though, was when I gave the pics to my VP of sales saying, You need to take a look at these. The stricken look on his face made me wonder what secrets he was keeping. But I did get a cool bonus for capturing our competition's evil plans and got one over on a sneering Pratt who spent too long on the toilet. Well, I certainly wouldn't assume what OP did is necessarily legal, but sorry to feel bad for a guy who was just a total jerk, right? This next story is Petty Responds to a Death Threat. Once upon a time, I worked with banks that foreclosed on houses. I wasn't a lawyer. I wasn't an employee of the bank. I just kept track of houses and made sure they were clean, secure, had no title or boundary issues, no hazmat, no septic leaks, mold, and whatnot. One aspect of this was to take possession of houses from the former owners, make sure they hadn't been stripped, get power, gas, and water transferred to the banks, and sometimes giving the former owners a check. There were a couple of programs I handled, one of which was a deed in lieu of foreclosure, in which the banks through their lawyers would give the people who couldn't afford their mortgage, often a second or third mortgage involved, a check if they simply walked away and didn't go through the formality of foreclosure. I had nothing to do with the legal aspects. I simply made sure the house hadn't been burned down, fairly common, or abandoned, and at the end I would inspect to make sure the house hadn't been stripped or vandalized, and hand over the check. While waiting for the handoff, I would drive by once a week to make sure the house was still there, wasn't being rented out on Craigslist, common scam, make sure it wasn't abandoned, not being used as a dumping ground and the like, but I only cared about the house itself, not involved with the people inside. During the process, I would introduce myself, explain why I was taking photos once a week, what to expect, and let them know that when I eventually showed up with cash, I wasn't pulling a scam. It tended to make everything run more smoothly and avoided calls to 911 from occupants saying, Some guy keeps taking pictures of my house and driving away. The house in question was a four bed, three bath, three car garage, about 3,500 square feet in a good part of town. They had probably skipped about $20,000 of mortgage payments, taxes, insurance, and water bills by the time I got involved, and the bank was offering them a check for $15,000 to walk away without going through foreclosure and eviction, on the condition that they leave the house broom clean with no stolen fixtures or vandalism. One day they came by my office to argue about the situation. I had nothing to do with the actual process, but I was a convenient face, so this mid-40s couple with designer handbags pulled up in their Range Rover and proceeded to waste 20 minutes of my time telling me it was unfair and they deserved more money. They didn't like being told to take it up with the bank and the attorney, or if they didn't want to go through with it, then I had even less involvement than I already did. I was used to a fair bit of abuse, but I didn't take it personally, just chalked it up to the bad situation and let it go. But this lady, wearing too much filler and drawn eyebrows that were so arched they could support a bridge and lots of gold baubles and a faux fur coat, crossed a line when she shouted as she was leaving, you had better start looking under your car before you started. Was I scared? Not even a little. I got much more credible threats every now and then, but was I annoyed? Absolutely. A couple of weeks later, I was sent to trade the check for the keys. Smug lady was there, copping an attitude and being far more rude than anybody else I ran into on these deals. So I do my inspection, checking for broom clean condition and no damage beyond normal wear and tear. I was generally extremely lenient with my inspections, but after the death threat, I wasn't going to cut as much slack. It was mostly okay, but in one of the bathrooms, the toilet paper roll holder, legally a fixture, had been ripped off the wall, leaving two quarter-sized holes in the drywall. That's a stolen fixture and intentional damage to boot. Sorry, I have to report this to the bank slash their lawyer for approval to proceed. I take several photos, taking my time to get items for scale in the shot, and leave with a check. 
I already knew the bank would release the money, far greater damages were allowed to slide in the past. So it wasn't as if I was actually affecting them beyond delaying the check for a few days. But they woke up that day expecting $15,000 and weren't getting it. Three days later, I was sent back to reinspect. The holes were now covered with cheap drywall patch, probably a $5 kit from Home Depot. So I handed over the check, take the keys, escort them to the front door, close it behind them, and start drafting my punch list, which includes a standard allowance for drywall repair. Honestly, I just think this line of work is never going to necessarily be glamorous or too fulfilling. I mean, when you work in a field that centers solely around foreclosures or kind of related to it, most of the time it's not a good or happy scenario. This next story is, got my bully back. There's this kid in my class, he bullies mainly girls, stealing pencils, breaking our stuff, shoving, hitting, swearing, ruining work even trying to cut our hair. Basically, he won't leave us alone. I've been trying to ignore him, but it's just not working. After he broke my ruler when I was out of class, sick due to a medical condition, I wanted revenge. Small victory, but it's enough for me. Me and a friend colored a Q-tip yellow and red, adding some glue to it to make it look used. Then another classmate stuck it on the back of Bully's neck. He was super freaked out. His reaction was hilarious and all we could do was laugh. We told him it was glue in the end, but he kept on nervously glancing at us for the rest of the lesson, which was a nice change. I don't think he'll be messing with us anytime soon. Definitely very small revenge in comparison to other posts. I needed somewhere to share though. Hey, I think I'd much rather hear stories like this, rather than something that gets you written up or in detention or maybe causes some kind of bodily harm or even like a public shaming thing, like at least they didn't go and try to cut the bully's hair too. Our next story is Rude Grocery Store Manager. I bought some groceries from Kroger's, and the cashier forgot to give me two of my bags. Those bags had two ribeye steaks, one pound of lean beef, 12 ounces of center cut bacon, and some smaller items. Didn't notice until I got home. Called the store's customer service. It rang for about five minutes. I was folding laundry so I don't care about letting it ring. Finally, someone answered and was really annoyed based on the tone of voice. I explained what happened and asked who the cashier was. I told her. She put me on hold. Music played for a bit and then it went to ringing for a few minutes and then it just hung up. I was irritated. Thought about driving back to the store in person but didn't. Instead, the next time I went to Kroger, I got my usual items but I got double the steak and bacon went through the self-checkout and didn't scan those items. I scanned everything else, and placed the bags with the scanned items on top of the meats that I hadn't scanned. If they had noticed and said anything, I would have just said I forgot, but the workers didn't notice. Petty? Yes, but it felt great. This is one of those weird things where it feels like morally wrong to do, but also fair enough. I don't know if I would have the kahunas to do that, but... Can you really blame OP? I mean, this store just totally let them down. Our next story is, be a rude and insulting customer? Sweet dreams. Several years ago, I was an assistant manager for a national chain auto parts store, one that everybody knows. Two people were required to open the store each morning. The store opened at 7 a.m., but we were to be inside at 6.30 a.m. to perform the opening tasks. One cold, clear morning, me and a coworker arrive at 6.30 and head to the door. Before we even reached the door, this raging lunatic comes stomping towards us, holding a sack and yelling, You clown sold me the wrong part! I said, Okay, we'll get you the right one. As I was unlocking the door, I could tell he was planning to enter the store with us. Now here is the first of the petty revenge. I could easily have let him in and quickly resolved his issue. But for obvious reasons, that was not going to happen. I told him, I'm sorry, but customers are not allowed in except during store hours. We open at 7. He replied, I've got a plane to catch. The airport he was headed for was Memphis International, a solid 45 minutes away on a good day. During rush hour, it's anyone's guess how long it would take. The co-worker and I entered and locked the door behind us. The lunatic went back to his car. We completed the opening procedures, and I sat in the office, waiting until precisely 7 o'clock. 
At 7, I headed to the door, expecting Psycho to be standing there, but he wasn't. I looked out and saw him sitting in his car, head tilted on the back seat, asleep. Morning sun shining brightly. I chuckled to myself and unlocked the door. Around 7.15, he still hadn't come in and when I looked out, his car was gone, having driven off with his incorrect part and hopefully missing his flight after a stressful rush to the airport. I think it goes without saying, but this was completely on this guy for just trying to exchange these parts before he's going to the airport. I mean, I don't know what urgent matters they had to attend to, but they did things all kinds of wrong. Definitely pays off sometimes to be that person that goes to the airport an hour early, even if you've got to like sit around for a while. Our next story is, insult me, I'll humiliate you on live TV. This happened a long time ago at the beginning of my career. I'm now retired. I was working as a field service tech for a company that made electronic equipment for radio and TV stations. One of our products was a primitive by today's standards, on-screen graphics generator. We crammed as much functionality as we could into a box about the size of a dorm refrigerator. So one day, I got sent out to a Midwest TV station to fix a malfunctioning unit. And this is where our story begins. I met at the airport by a station employee and we swing by my hotel to drop off my luggage and check in. I grab my tools and test gear and head over to the TV station where I met by the chief engineer. Since the graphics generator was currently in use, he played back a videotape of the newscast that showed the problem. Basically, the weathermen had a scrolling graphics of the current conditions and forecast. Occasionally, the new line of text that entered the bottom of the screen would glitch, and a line of corrupted text would scroll up the screen. This would be accompanied by a snide remark by the weatherman insulting the station engineers and techs, or my employers, products, and personnel. Dang, what a jerk, I muttered under my breath. Yes, he is, agreed the CE. He acts like this whole TV station is here just for him. Good to know. I'll shorten this next part. Between the noon and evening newscast... I managed to locate the problem with the graphics generator, but as luck would have it, I didn't have the right spare part. It was an odd thing to fail, so I told the CE I would have the replacement board FedExed and we can fix the graphics generator in the morning. Then the weatherman looked in and inquired about the graphics generator. When we told him the bad news, he proceeded to insult me, the station for using our products, the station technical staff, and anyone else he could think of. Okay, crap just got real, and a plan hatched. I looked at the CE and asked him, You wouldn't happen to have a spare 74LS? I forget the actual part number, laying around. Actually, he said, I believe we do. So, extract the malfunctioning board, run down to the shop, unsolder the bad chip, drop in the new one, back upstairs to the control room, install the fixed board and test. It works perfectly just in time to get the graphics generator set up for the evening newscast. The revenge, as the evening newscast began, I made myself comfortable at the back of the control booth, just to, you know, be available in case of problems. When the weather report came on, the graphics operator had the scroll queued up. I nudged her out of her chair and took over. I turned off scrolling and sent the graphics live, unscrolling. The weatherman looked at the camera and made a snide comment about malfunctioning equipment. I turned the scroll on. As the weatherman turned back toward his monitor, the text he needed to read was slowly disappearing off the top of the screen. He got flustered, lost it, began stammering and tripping over his words. To rub it in, as he would start to catch up with the scroll, I would tweak the scroll speed to make it slightly faster so he could never catch up. Hilarity was ensuing in the control booth and the studio. Everyone knew what was going on and they were happy to see this grade A flaming jerk finally getting his comeuppance live. They had to go to commercial break to allow everyone to regain composure as the weatherman stormed out of the studio. Honestly, I'm surprised that somebody that pompous in the weatherman position would be allowed to continue on for so long. Like, I feel like you have to be like some beloved accredited news anchor to be able to be that much of a jerk and still hold down your job. 
Also, and I don't know if this is too obscure of a reference nowadays, but it kind of reminded me of a Drake and Josh episode. Just puts the picture in my head of a relentlessly sweaty, stuttering buffoon up there trying to desperately find the words for the weather newscast. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another awesome revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.